Hey guys, welcome back to Confessions of a Rideshare Driver. Um, today I wanted to, almost, almost wasn't going to do this one. Um, this relates to an experience I've had probably more in LA than when I was in Chicago. Again, for those who don't know, uh, I drove rideshare for about five years in LA, only one year in Chicago. So I'm on my way out of Chicago. And, uh, wasn't sure about doing this one and uh you know in the stories that I've recounted with friends like you have to share you have to talk about this one this one's really interesting my concern is that <clears throat> I don't know there, there's a real sort of schizophrenia <clears throat> excuse me and from what I can see a lot of hypocrisy around the issue anything re revolving around um sexual attraction sex period. And let me be real clear that what I'm talking about, uh, what I'm talking about is consenting relations between adults. That's where I draw the line. And so I just want to make it real clear, um, that even that topic for some people can be too much. Um, you know, it makes them uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about it. And then they go home and hop on Pornhub. So yeah, that's where we're at. And the reason I decided, okay, I will talk about this is because it's something that is kind of like this unifier among human beings. It's such a built-in drive for all of us. Uh, and every year, like in the aforementioned Pornhub drops that study that shows what each state is watching and, and all of that. And I, I just, I'm fascinated by the whole thing. I'm fascinated by what makes people tick. I'm fascinated by psychology of people, how people's experience informs who they are, and so much of this podcast is about that, because that's really what I think I learned the most uh, in this experience as a rideshare driver, is just really getting to know people. You get this funhouse mirror view of what the world is like through social media and mainstream media, and then I get in my car, and, you know, I would crisscross the county. I go through so many different cities, so many different neighborhoods, different walks of life, socioeconomic statuses, cultures. And you realize, wow, all of this, not to say that there aren't bad things happening in the world, because there are, but most people aren't living their lives cranked up to 11, angry all the time. They're just not. Most people are trying to build careers, build lives, raise families, build businesses, uh, you know, a lot of people are just trying to get through the day and they don't have time for this emotionalist, tribalist nonsense um, that is so pervasive on you know, social media and media in general. Um, so anyways, uh, one of the more interesting aspects of my rideshare experience as a driver was uh, how people reacted to me and I'm going to be upfront. I don't think I'm the most handsome guy. Um, you know, uh, I, <laughs> I was told by a friend once, you're a Chicago 10, but you're an LA 5. And I think that that's yeah, pretty accurate. Um, maybe some of my friends in Chicago would disagree. I don't know. But yeah, so especially in LA, you pick up a lot of really beautiful people. And let's refer to them, you know, as... The beautiful people, and I mean just people who just in general are extremely good looking, a ton of models, you have a ton of uh, adult content creators, I don't know if I would include actors necessarily, I did pick up some actors whose names I'm not going to drop here, um, not, necessarily, not necessarily beautiful people, but people who are in the public eye, and I, I'd like to keep it towards, <clears throat> again, the, the people who are beautiful. And I do think that there is an objective standard of beauty. But I'd also say that there are people that you meet who maybe when you first meet them, they don't seem beautiful to you. And then you get to know them. And they become beautiful. You know, that happens. But I mean people who are just, you know, Fibonacci sequence, completely symmetrical look, you know, in terms of their features and all of that. And uh, there's quite a few of them. 
and you know I picked up quite a lot of them and it's so interesting I think let's start with models uh, have picked up and, and given rides to a fair share of models in my time as a rideshare driver again more uh, more LA than Chicago uh, because obviously the industry's here in in LA and what I find most interesting about models is for the most part, and again, this is just based on my experience, I'm not trying to make a blanket statement. There may be people who fall outside of what I've observed. So um, again, this is just my firsthand experience. There seem to be two kind of camps, at least where models are concerned, at least my interaction with models as a driver. And the first camp are people who are, you know, like the really attractive woman from Michigan or Minnesota, you know, some Midwestern state, who is just stunningly gorgeous, uh, comes to LA for opportunities and knows she's beautiful, but still has that sort of Midwestern groundedness. Um, yeah, there, there, there's quite a lot of those that, uh, you know, you're sort of surprised. At least I was, because I, I sort of met that mid Midwestern model uh, later, uh, but they do exist. I would say they're, they're, they seem to be kind of a minority in terms of them just being very talkative. Just in L.A., you know, people will get in your car and, you know, depending on what part of town, town you're on, especially anywhere like west of La Brea. So let's say west side, you know, if they're industry, they're attractive and they're west of La Brea, you're not going to get a whole lot of conversation out of these people. And that can be for a good reason. If they are industry, they have to guard themselves because they're used to people trying to extract stuff from them all the time, contacts, opportunities, and so on. And so it's understandable that they would want to guard themselves and not maybe be so warm. And I want to be clear because it's, I think, maybe in previous episodes, it sounds like I am coming down really hard on West Siders uh, in LA. And uh, I don't mean to do that. They, again, they, they aren't as warm, but there's reasons for that, I think. So with models, occasionally you get that uh, outgoing, grounded, smiley, talkative model who is from the Midwest. So actually, let me amend my statement. So those three types. Um, and I'd say the smallest is that Midwestern model that I just referred to. The other two, uh, in terms of models that I've experienced, that I've had interaction with, one are the, and again, I'll explain why I think this is the very, very sort of defensive, cold, sometimes almost uh, overly defensive model. And this goes for men and women as these are people who are, again, as I said, stunningly gorgeous. Just, I mean, beautiful. And what I don't think the average person realizes, and I, I didn't until I really, you know, had enough experience and started to think about, you know, why is, why are these people so, hmm, you know, sort of severe, sort of cold, so defensive? And it's not unlike the industry people on the West Side they have to protect themselves because they are constantly getting barraged by, frankly, idiots, people who think that because they are attractive, that it's okay to hit on them. It's okay to just talk to them like they're some type of a sex object, which blows my mind why you would speak to anybody that way. You know. But there's sort of a, a defense, a shell, an armor that these people have to develop because while they do make their living and they get a lot of their advantage from how they look, and there definitely is pretty privilege, um, and it just is. I'm not saying it's a bad thing or it should be scaled back or punished or it just is. I'm not, I'm not about, you know, that, but the reality for these people is they do get a lot of attention that attention helps them in a way that they're able to monetize, they're able to get opportunities, they're able to travel the world. Uh, again, make money just by virtue of how they look, which is amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing to me about human psychology and it's, you know, it has to be something that it's, it's built into our biology, a product of evolution, that you see these people and you're just, you're just like, wow, 
that person is stunning looking. That person is, is, is truly beautiful. Um, but the, the dark cloud of that silver lining is that they probably get a lot of attention they don't want. They're constantly getting hit on. And so by the time they get into my car, um, and I'm just, you know, being friendly, trying to chat them up. It's like, hi, good morning. Okay. And, and they're just, they're done because they've been so barraged, uh, again, by these idiots that, um, yeah, they're just, oh God, I just, I just want a quiet ride so I can get to my agent. I just want a quiet ride just to get home. I don't want to be talked to. I don't want to be chatted up by this driver. And let me be really clear that I don't hit on any of these people. I, I've always been super hyper aware of just being as professional as possible while I was a driver. Because anybody can report anybody for anything uh, ever, uh, you know, these days. And uh, the last thing I want to do is, you know, also, I don't want to come off like a creeper or uh, a jerk. Because that gets reflected in, in your, uh, your rating. You know, riders rate me, and I, as the driver, rate the riders. And it's like, everybody's cool. Just I mean, it was really super rare that I ever gave people low ratings. And I always tried to comport myself in a way that uh, necessitated a, a good review. So anyways, these folks... Again, by virtue of how they look, you know, get a, a fair amount of unwanted attention. The rest of us probably, you know, we'll never know what that's like. And so there's that defensiveness, uh, the coldness. You know, I'm keeping my sunglasses on. I'm not talking to you. Or if I do greet you back, eh, you know, sometimes it's a little um, curt, a little sharp. And it's like, okay, I can take the hint. I'm not going to bother you. So that was the other one. Um, the other, uh, so that's the second one. So Midwestern models, uh, sort of defensive, you know, standoffish, maybe cold. But the third is probably the worst. And this behavior isn't limited to models. Okay, I want to be real clear that the spoiled, entitled model uh, is a trip. And there's, there's quite a few of them that I encountered. Not to say that models are the only ones that can be spoiled or uh, entitled, because lots of people can't be. And we seem to have a surplus here in L.A., which is probably not surprising. Not that all of L.A. is like that. It's not. Um, it's, it's easy to paint L.A. with a broad brush, like it's easy to paint where I came from, Chicago, with a broad brush. And that tends to be done by people who have never visited either place or have never spent significant time in either place. But the, uh, the entitled model is interesting. I, you know, again, I didn't drive for um, any of the luxury rideshare uh, platforms. I was just very basic my entire way through. So it's not like I'm rolling up in an Escalade or I'm rolling up in a Yukon or whatever. Um, Lexus, that wasn't me. I'm rolling up in a basic black sedan. And it would be interesting to me uh, that some of these folks would get in the car and say, do you have any water? <laughs> like, no, I don't. Well, why not? It's like, well, that's overhead. And, you know, you can get water anywhere. I mean, not that I said that, but just more like, no, I, I, I don't. It's not something that I offer. And, you know, again, I don't offer because it's, you know, why would I put, again, get your coffee, get your water. You're a grown adult. Take care of that thing before you ride or grab it, you know, whatever. And sometimes people would look at me sideways like, why don't you have chilled water here for me? And again, it's just like, because I'm not the luxury service that maybe you're accustomed to. You do know, you know, what ride you ordered, right? And some, some people, again, uh, had their rides ordered by other people. I do remember a couple of guys and a couple of gals that uh, were very upset that I was not the luxury uh, ride that they were accustomed to, which I always find interesting because at the time that I was riding, I mean, those rides were, well, the time that I was driving, those rides were minimum 150 bucks. Like it was ridiculous, which makes sense. You know, if you're driving an Escalade, you're driving, you know, Yukon Suburban, whatever, uh, that's a lot of gas. That's, you know, your insurance is higher. 
So we, obviously those rides you should be able to charge more for. But it always boggled my mind that when I did get uh, those folks that were upset, I, like this ride's seventeen dollars, and I'm going to get you there just as quick as anyone else would. Why are you mad? But you know that seems to be built into a sense of status, and so much of people's self-esteem out here is tied into image and status and and what you have. And God, it's sad. It, at least to me, there's nothing wrong with wanting and having nice things, nice cars, nice home. Uh, but that shouldn't be, I don't think that should be the end in itself. I think if you're living right, again, my opinion, if you're living right, you're following your passion. You're letting your love lead. That's what I like to, to tell people. Let your love lead. Whatever that passion is, figure out a way to make a career out of that and the money will come. I mean, maybe you won't be a millionaire. Maybe you will. Maybe you'll be going to do a, a silly podcast about your niche interest that somehow blows up or you find your people. You're able to get sponsors. And whew, great. Now you've got, you know, you know, a, 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 several classic cars in your garage. You've got, you know, you know four-bedroom house or whatever it is. Nothing wrong with that. But there does seem to be a real connection for those folks, these these models that were miffed that I wasn't the luxury ride they had hoped for, uh, real tie to that image and that, that particular, that baller life, you know, um, and so that was always kind of interesting, the, the presumption that there would be chilled water for them, uh, the presumption, um, you know, or, or even people, <laughs> some people have snapped him, why are you talking to me? I'm like... I literally just said, good morning, I'm greeting you because we're both human beings. Okay? So sometimes that would be enough. Again, realizing that, you know, it's not me that's uh, the problem here. And that's okay. And then you just shut up, you listen to the radio, and, you know, <clears throat> get them on their way. It would be fun sometimes if people would come in, again, some of these more entitled models, and I, you know, I'll play whatever music they want for the, the duration of the ride. Um, but, like, I would have people lean from the back seat up front to just start plugging in their devices without <laughs> saying anything. I'm just like, whoa, you know, you can, you can just hand me the cord. I'll plug it in. Um, the sort of immediate uh, takeover of your vehicle, the, the, the presumption that they can just sort of do that was something that most people didn't do that these particular folks did. Um, this particular demographic of model, beautiful person, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, why are these people this way? And just the amount of people, like after a while, it started to dawn on me. Oh, oh, okay. These folks have never been told no. These people have been beautiful since birth and they basically just had people give them stuff. Clothes, money, cars, um, gifts, you name it. Because they're good looking. And because also because they're good looking, they just they're able to just get in places and, and, and do things that you know you or I would be like, get out of here. What what? Um and so by the time they get in my car and they ask for water and I don't have it or, you know, I don't have like a tray of mints or whatever it is, you know, they're looking for, uh, I guess it comes as a little bit of a shock to them, which again, I can't fathom because again, I've, I've not lived that experience. Uh, but what I also don't quite grasp is people's willingness. And again, overwhelming majority of my riders are cool people. And I would say that probably 70% of the models I picked up are cool people. It's just that other 30%, and then entitled, angry. Um, I assume there has something, it has something to do with, if you're beautiful and you're able to leverage that in life, you get everything you want. You're not used to being told no. You also don't have a whole lot of challenge in your life. 
I think this probably comes along with a, a lot of different forms of privilege. That if you know if you're born into a, a, a particular status or a particular way of life, that you don't have to struggle. You don't have to work really hard to just earn the basics, just to just get to just sort of like baseline okay. People who don't have to do that just do not understand. And I do think, and this is again, I'm not trying to compare the moral worth of people, but in my life, you know, uh, 30 plus years, I've just noticed that there is a level of gratitude, appreciation, a groundedness to people who really had to work their butts off to just get where they are. And I don't mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, people living some luxurious lifestyle or, or people that are even upper middle class. I mean, people who are just trying to get into the middle class, people who are just, okay, we're okay. We're, we're making the mortgage. Um, you know, we're taking care of kids' school. There's food on the table. You know, and having to work, you know, not just maybe five days a week, maybe six or seven and all that. I think that builds a type of of character that you really understand what is important, what it really takes to survive, and hoping that those efforts and that hard work and that tenacity will be enough to get you not just from surviving, but hopefully one day to thrive. And I think if you're someone who's never had to do that, you just see the world a different way and you don't quite understand maybe just how good you have it. Some people do. I, there, there are, I've dealt with wealthy people, uh, well-to-do people in places like the West Side, the Hollywood Hills that really have done a really good job, really good job of instilling in their children, uh, hey, do you know where this came from? This came from the fact that your grandparents that had nothing sacrificed every day, or not sacrificed, I hate that word. It's not a sacrifice. If you're working towards a value, it's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice is when you give something up of value for nothing. Your great grandparents or your grandparents or us, me, our, your parents, worked our butts off. Uh, we would forego very vacations. We would forego maybe nicer car, we would forego these these um, nicer things in life so that we could get to a point where we don't have to worry about, you know, the house is paid off, The um, we have passive income that allows you guys to not maybe have an after school job and does allow you to go and study and do things that you really love and so on. So encountered plenty of people that really instilled uh, those values and, and that understanding um, into their kids. So I want to be real clear that, again, that I'm not painting with too broad a brush here. But, you know, there's a fair amount of people that I've met that in the hills and other places completely miserable because they've never had to earn anything for themselves. And because they've never had to earn anything for themselves, they don't have self-respect. And I think that that carries over for some of these very beautiful people who simply by turning over in bed in the morning make more money than you or I might make in a month, three months, six months. And hey, good for them. You know, they got a, a, a uh, strong roll of the dice and it worked out for them in a way. So they've got the money. You know, and, and beauty does fade, so you have to take care of yourself, or I hope that those people are, you know, uh, investing that money wisely, because at some point you do probably have to pivot away from from the modeling. Uh, some people don't. Some people just really hold on to their stuff forever. But, uh, yeah, I would assume that the, the models that are, you know, a little um, cranky, grumpy, upset entitled, um, you know, and uh, not happy that I don't have sparkling water in the back seat. I think that's where that comes from. But, so those are the three kinds of, of models that I've encountered. And I, I guess to sort of step away from, again, these types that I've encountered, 
I'm just absolutely fascinated at how human beings, when they see a beautiful person, and I, this seems to be true, really true of men. I, I don't I feel like women, obviously women, of course, are drawn to a beautiful man. You know, you look at guys that I, let's say two guys I think are objectively good looking. You've got, you've got your Henry Cavills, you've got your Jason Momoa's. You know, it's, I think it's pretty clear that these guys are, you know, handsome dudes, fit dudes, um, and symmetrical features, everything. Obviously women, women and men uh, would be attracted to that. But I feel in the case of women, I just feel like in my experience, again, I think that women are capable of being less shallow than men. And the reason I, I, I feel this way is I, I just observe this in, you know, my male friends. I observe this in what I've seen on social media. Again, I know I just said social media is kind of a funhouse mirror view of life, and it can be. But I see the followings that some of these, whether you're a female Instagram model, or you are a female model, or you are a female adult content creator, the massive following that these women have, the waiting on bated breath that the that their male fans do for them. I can't remember the name of the the woman, but she's huge presence on uh, on social media. And I think what did she do? She sold I think she was selling vials of her own bath water for I guess maybe a hundred dollars a pop. I can't remember exactly. I think she cleared a million dollars in a month. <laughs> And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I can't do that. For as there probably being privileges that I have as a male, uh, that I undoubtedly do have, and depending on the situation, I do not have the, that kind of power. <laughs> that this young woman could, you know, who is beautiful and has this because she has this beauty, has this sort of influence over men, could sell her bath water for what, $100 an ounce or whatever it was, and clear a million dollars in a very short amount of time, or whatever it was. It was a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, you know, for as, as many advantages as I have as a man, that is not one of them. I mean, maybe I could get you know, into better shape than I am. I'm not a slouch, but, you know, maybe I just, you know, get completely ripped and, you know, out of my skull and uh, get, you know, maybe there's something I could leverage there. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think I'm ever going to make the kind of money that this this lady did. But it's, uh, it's fascinating to me. Uh, I also have a family member who works for an agency that manages the social media accounts of people like the woman I just mentioned. And that's something that I think people really need to know is these people who have millions of followers, <clears throat> it's impossible for these people to make the content they do, the photo shoots, the videos, what have you, um, and also respond to all of these messages. So they don't. They hire agencies to respond for them. And it's so wild to me that I have a family member who's a male who responds on behalf of a female model to her male fans. And it's so interesting, these guys, you know, what they write, what they, you know, it's like, you know, it's been a while since you uploaded new videos, or it's been a while since you uploaded a, you know, a photo shoot. And this, this psychology, I'm just, is, you know, some of these guys, it's like they really live for this stuff. And these women have absolute power over these guys. You know, if these women told them to get on all fours and bark like a dog and send me a video of it, they would. They would. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. It's pretty pathetic in my view. But the the influence, again, that's why they call them influencers, that these women exercise over hundreds of thousands, probably millions, possibly tens of millions of men is, is so fascinating to me that a beautiful body, a beautiful face 
can completely capture someone's attention. And again, I think it's, I think it does more for, I think men are more susceptible to that than women are. Again, I do think, and again, I'm not uh, catering here. You know, I'm not patronizing. I do think there's something in the female of the species that is a little more practical. I think you know, there are far more women out there that when evaluating a man, take everything into consideration, not just his Death Star delts and his uh, his Abercrombie knob and his, his, his abs. And obviously, you know, that, that gets people in the door, that, that grabs people attention, people's attention, but I don't know that that's necessarily what, uh, you know, unless a woman is really into fitness and she's a fitness enthusiast or, uh, you know, maybe a coach or, or, or whatever, and then maybe it does matter a bit more, but I think women are more, uh, inclined, not to, again, to say that it's every case, more inclined to see the whole picture of a man. Whereas I think men, and obviously particularly young men, although you know, maybe not just young men, because I know guys in their 40s and 50s that follow some of these women and are just gaga over them. And it's just like, ooh. Again, I'm just amazed that that one thing, that aspect of, I, I guess it would be evolution, uh, just grabs men. I, when I was in school, this was this a couple years ago, or not a couple years ago, uh, when I was in school for, say, massage therapy, when I was in university back in Chicago. And again, we've had the internet now piped into our home since, what, the mid-90s? I was always surprised by the guys that would see a beautiful woman and would just be like, could not be cool at all. It just would just be... And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, you have the internet, right? You can look at a beautiful woman anytime you want. And they just had a really hard time. It's like they just had to stare at this woman. Not necessarily her being aware of it or her, you know, them purposely being creepers, but they're just they they could not help themselves. They just had to stare at this woman as she as she passed by or walked down the street, and they're just um just and again, not being creepers, just being in true awe of this woman. She has all the power. And I, I think sometimes we forget that. Again, never tolerate a guy being a creeper or being a jerk. I don't. You shouldn't either. But that's not what these guys were doing. They're just... That woman could turn around and ask them to do anything. And they would do it. Again, there, there's uh, that, that power and influence of pretty, of beautiful, is amazing to me. On the other hand, uh, I've had conversations with friends, even, you know, conversations with writers, you know, talk about, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you, in LA, you pass billboards all the time of this new movie coming out, this new TV series, you know, it's like, you know, have like the biggest actor um, going right now and, you know, looking great on the, on the poster, maybe somewhere on Sunset Boulevard or Hollywood or wherever. And sometimes like, oh, hey, have you seen Blankety Blank Movie? What do you think of this guy? What do you think of this gal? And, you know, depending on how long the ride was, sometimes we would drill down pretty deep. And one actor in particular who has just been on absolute fire since probably about 2009. That's when I first noticed this guy. I'm not going to give you his name because uh, I don't like to talk. You know, again, I'm still trying to uh, make my own way through the industry, uh, but this isn't somebody that I have any resentment towards. But I did kind of notice, he's not a bad looking guy, but he's not Henry Cavill handsome. He's not um, Jason Momoa handsome. He's not, you know, one of those guys. And again, I know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and it can be subjective, but I think Henry and Jason are pretty good examples of it. It's like, okay, yeah, these guys are 11 out of 10s. This particular actor who was on this uh, uh, billboard done really well for himself. He's stacked with with muscle now, um, has a recurring role in a great franchise, looks great. But you take away the beautiful hair, which I think might be extensions. Again, I'm not hating. I'm just, 
I think it might be. And you take away all that muscle because he, you know, he's had to put that on over the years for these roles. Not that handsome a guy, not bad looking, but I, you know, have talked, I was talking to this one woman in particular. Um, and I've talked to, after that, I talked to friends about it because I was sort of fascinated that this woman was absolutely transfixed that this was, this guy was some type of a true Adonis. And there are Adonises out there. Don't get me wrong. They exist. I've been in LA seven years now. And uh, I won't say we grow them on trees out here, but pretty close. This guy isn't one of them. You know, the body, yes. You know, the body, it's it's hard work. Uh, it's training. It's it's dedication to diet and, and never letting up from that. Uh, again, hair, you know, you've got people to do that for you and whatnot. But in terms of features, and again, I know I'm no prize. <laughs> I'm not comparing myself and saying that I'm somehow, you know, better looking than a lot of these uh, folks, because I'm not. But it's like, okay, you take away the hair, you take away the muscles, this guy's, yeah, he's pleasant looking, but he's not uh, a god among men by any means. But the fact that he's an A-lister in a really big uh, movie series and... You know, the dude looks, his body at least looks like he fell out of Olympus. That's enough for this to be um, suddenly um, Michelangelo's David. It's the, the that layer of fame, uh, of familiarity. Uh, it's interesting how that can change things uh, for people, people's perceptions. Because it's something that I kind of, and I've, I've noticed all the time, it's like, okay, because someone is a movie star, or becomes, because someone is uh, well-known, or they've done well, suddenly that, in the eyes of many people in the public, makes them beautiful. Which is, it, it, when maybe they're, I mean, again, not unpleasant looking, but not, um, you know, again, not Adonis's. Again, I'm it's, it's interesting how that, you know, you, you, you put the sort of apparatus of the industry uh, of success. And, you know, and I'm not hating on that success. Again, I'm, you know, trying to get a piece of that myself. You know, trying to grow a career. Uh, you know, again, I don't necessarily want fame. I don't necessarily want celebrity. But regular work, good work, that's all. You know, I don't need, uh, I don't, I don't, you know need to be, uh, you know, I mean, more than that. But I do find it interesting how we do perceive people who are, you know, good, okay, you're all right looking, uh, to be so much more than they are because of the uh, success around them and the work that they've done and the bodies that they've built. I, I find that, you know, interesting. Um, Yeah, the, the, again, going back to the Instagram models, again, I, I have a family member who has, has managed accounts and, you know, just the amount of guys out there that really live for uh, interacting with these ladies, which they don't realize that they aren't. And I, you'd think, you know, I, I would imagine, let's say you just have 10,000 followers and, you know, you're, you're an Instagram model and there's nothing wrong with that. You make your money however, you know with inflation, with, you know, how hard life can be, how hard life can hit, you know, whatever you have to do to make it in life, so long as you are not breaking, you know, you're not hurting anybody and you're not stealing anybody's property. You're not violating anybody's rights. You do what you have to do. You, you know, that's, you do, you know, that's fine. So again, I'm not in any way hating or disparaging any of this, but so let's say you're Instagram model and maybe you've only got 10,000 followers. You're, you're, you know, that's, I mean, are you really going to be responding to the messages from thousands of people? Probably not. You know, and it's even less likely if you have 100, 100 plus thousand. You know, I've, I've seen, you know, we have these people that are like 1 million, 2 million, 5 million followers. There's no way that's you responding. And I'm kind of, I think it's kind of sad that these guys that, again, my family member responds to working for this agency that manages these uh, models' accounts really think that they're hearing from this person. It's like, she's got two million followers, dude. What are you thinking? 
So there's it's that that's kind of sad to me. But again, the power and influence that that models look and and, and well crafted image and, and, and all that and beauty holds over these guys. It's like wow, wow. Um, it's just really quite interesting. And then again, that's got to be a project product of our our evolution, our biology, that there's, you just can't look away. You know, they, they've done studies that, uh, you know, with babies, that somebody who has a baby will, will stay more focused longer on someone who has very symmetrical features versus someone who doesn't have more symmetrical features. And so there is an, an objective uh, sense of beauty, uh, parameter for beauty in that respect. And, and I think we kind of should acknowledge that. That's not to say that people who have different looks aren't beautiful. I, I really like, there's a lot of people that have what I guess would be called unconventional looks. I think are absolutely beautiful. You know, I, it's, it's, uh, that's just me. And I think that that's probably more, you know, of course you're drawn to people who have that symmetrical look as well, but in some ways it's almost a turnoff. Again, I'm just speaking for myself, but people who are just, they're too good looking. It's like, oof. You know, and I, again, having the experience that I've had, it's like, okay, what are the odds that you, and again, not to say that doesn't happen, but what are the odds that you look that good that you've had to, you've had to develop a personality? If you're not that good looking or you're just okay looking, you've got to figure out a different way to make your way through life. And I feel that, let's say, let's take like comedic actors or, or stand-up comedians. These folks make their way by being clever, by being funny, by being charming. Uh, and, you know, we kind of have to, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to right now at this moment, it's December and I've been trying to stay on top of everything by working out and, and all that. Would I look as great in a Speedo right now as maybe I did this summer? No, you know, I'm not going to be turning too many heads, maybe a couple. But, um, where was I going with this? Sorry. Uh, the, I think that beauty can be a trap. Being a beautiful person, being a stunningly attractive person can be a trap because if you're able to leverage that into a great life, but a life where you are just sort of given things by virtue of the fact that you're being be you're beautiful you're, and you're used to getting your way, you don't have to, tr you might not have to try as hard in other areas and struggle a bit more in life that would contribute to maybe stronger character. Again, I'm not saying that beautiful people have poor character. I'm not saying beautiful people don't have to struggle or haven't struggled. That's not what I'm saying. But it's not the same as somebody who is not a model, uh, does not have that slam and bod that they can take pictures of all the time and put up on social media and then get monetized and get sponsors and whew, before you know it they've got you know a line of supplements or a cosmetics line and you know you know those folks have to do it a different way they've got to either come up with a really interesting podcast or they've got to come up with a uh, some type of a character or a gimmick or, or you know and, and and build it that way uh, so you know and I, I, I think that there's from what I observed at least there's there's something missing. One person I talked to was aware of it. That was interesting. She was she was really bright. She was and I'm, again I'm not saying models aren't bright. I'm not saying they aren't. But this one particular woman that I talked to, she uh, she came right out. Uh, and again I we were talking and I was sort of working around it. I wasn't just flat out asking her, so you're incredibly attractive. What's that like? <laughs> How easy is your life? And we just talked and I believe she was from the Northeast. I don't know if she was from New York, Massachusetts, somewhere in the Northeast. So, and I find that in general, people in the Northeast are way more apt to converse. I love people from the Northeast. Northeasterners, People from the South and people from the Midwest, I f have found in my experience, tend to be more talkative and open. And, uh, you know, she's like, so, you know, what, uh, what are you doing in L.A.? Like, she clocked me immediately. She's like, you're not. You're not from L.A. And I'm like, no, I'm not. 
I said, but I love LA and I've chosen to make it my home. I've chosen to embrace it. But you know, I'm from Chicago. She's like, oh, okay, yep, yep, that that tracks. I'm like, all right, okay, whatever that means. Uh, but she's like, you know, she, I'm, I'm from back east. And uh, she's like, so what brings you out here? I'm like, well, big surprise, screenwriter, actor. And this is, you know, this is a side hustle for me to, again, have the time to go and pursue those other things. She's like, that's great. And I said, how about yourself? And she's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a model and an entrepreneur. And she laughs, she's like, you know, new entrepreneur. So she's like, I'm not building the businesses. And then she proceeded to sort of explain to me that she's like, you know, I'm not, I might not always have this face. I might not always have this body. And so, you know, I'm pivoting, uh, taking the money that I've been making off of the gifts that I've, you know, been born with and putting into, uh, you know, a business, you know, real estate, and I think you know, some other things. And that was, that was really refreshing to, to hear that. Well, it's refreshing that anybody that beautiful uh, talks that much. Because in general, they don't. They're, they're pretty tight-lipped. Again, because they're so used to people being creeps and being jerks and constantly hitting on them and, you know, all of that, which, so, it, it makes sense. But, uh, yeah, this woman, she's just like, yep, yeah, yep, that's the deal. You know, I'm good-looking, incredibly blessed, and, uh, but I know I, it's not necessarily going to last forever, so I have to, um, I've got to figure something else out, you know, and I'm in a position where I have the money that I can explore other things. I can build a business if I want to. I can look into hobbies that maybe might become future careers and all that. And she was uh, she was super cool. Again, I uh, I've I've never had a bad experience with a, uh, a northeasterner in in the car. So uh, enjoy those people. They're very direct, you know, and some that 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 can that can be off putting, I think, for some West Coasters. Uh, but being from Chicago, culturally, you know, whether it's, you know, Chicago to New York, Chicago to Boston, Chicago to Philly, Chicago to uh, Baltimore, uh, you know, it, it, the people are, you know, they have a low BS tolerance. Um, they don't have to walk on eggshells because they're not in L.A. in the industry and don't have to necessarily worry about everything that might come out of their mouth or what feelings or opinion or food they like might affect their career. And so they just, just tend to be, you know, laid on the line. And that's very, uh, is very similar to Chicago. Uh, I had a conversation with a guy from New York City, really cool guy. And uh, he thought I was from New York. I'm like, Chicago. I'm like, oh, he's like, oh, that's right. Yeah, New York and Chicago. You know, it's different sports teams, different accents, same people. And that's very true. Um, I might go so far as to say that it's not that there are, there are, there's, there's pockets of, and I would say the east side of LA is pretty much the same. You know, uh, I would say east and southeast sides of LA are very much like that. But again, the further you get away from um, entertainment industry, the more relaxed people are and just, you know, just being themselves and, and all that don't. Might curse a little more. That's one thing. Ugh. And not to get off on a tangent here, but uh, man, people from uh, those of us from Chicago, I should say, man, we curse a lot. I it's, it wasn't until I got to California that I realized like these people almost it's almost like Mormon level uh, lack of cursing. And I can say that because I've had uh, uh, friends and, and and people that I've worked for in the past that are Mormon and they don't curse at all. Uh, great, great people that I worked with too. I, I really enjoyed working with those folks, but they don't curse. And I kind of feel it's similar in Southern and Northern California because I've spent enough time in both. I'm like, this folks out here don't curse. And I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how people do that because it can be so cathartic. But anyway, back to the beautiful people. So I kind of feel like that's, that's kind of where it's at with the models. Again, models are people just like anybody else. But I do think that they have unique, uh, obviously, experience that is unique to, you know, uh, who they are because they're models, because they're beautiful. They get way more attention probably than they want, uh, probably get hit on way too much, you know, people being too familiar with them because they're beautiful or attractive or sexy. And so those that are more guarded, more armored, more cold, more defensive, makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. 
uh, the more entitled folks, I just kind of pity. I pity those folks that if you, and I think anybody, you know, whether your uh, privilege is because you're pretty or because maybe you were born into a lot of wealth and you've just never had to work or earn anything for yourself, again, that that doesn't allow you the space, I think, sometimes to build uh, a stronger character. If you really have to go out there every day and just grind and hustle and you're able to build yourself into something, you appreciate it way more than if you were you had it handed you know, to you. And you don't understand what went into, you know, what what did your parents who built the life you're accustomed to, what did that really take? Or grandparents or whatever it was that, that built maybe something out of nothing. And now your parents and you just coast. You know, and that, that's where choosing uh, elective hardship in your life is really important. You've got to find something, whether it's a martial art, weightlifting, chess. Uh, learning a language, you, I mean, you've got to find something in life that that is hard, that you have to work at, that maybe kicks your butt, knocks you down, and and so that you're able to develop that self-respect, that self-esteem, that then becomes stronger character. So, anyways, uh, off my soapbox with the models, uh, the maybe. Okay, well, I'll make this quick on the adult content creators because that, that might need to be like an, an entire episode in itself uh, because I'm fascinated by by them, but have picked up my fair share of, uh, let's call them adult content creators because P-O-R-N-S-T-A-R-S, I don't know what the algorithm likes and what it doesn't like anymore. <laughs> and so you know, I, I want this to, to be seen by as many people as possible. And uh, I want the algorithm to like me. But picked up a fair share of, of porn stars, uh, of adult content creators, and one in particular that I, I won't name that in recent years has really blown up, ended up in, I think, the F Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. There was this whole article about the Internet's red light district and this individual just who came from very meager beginnings uh, has paid off his, his well, I guess, it, what can we know it's a he, paid off his mother's house, uh, has, has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to charity, has built an incredible life for himself, um, and did it within a very, very short amount of time, just a few years. And I think that's incredible. Again, we can, we can debate and discuss, you know, uh, whether somebody should be doing that or not. I think people should be free to do whatever they want. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's an endorsement, but again, you have to be free to choose your own values. And so uh, as long as you're free to choose your own values and you're not hurting anybody, I don't have a problem with it. But it was it was interesting. The, the adult performers that I've had in my car were just like anybody else. You know, I think that they're there, and it's probably true. I'm sure that there are people out there that have been traumatized or, you know, are damaged in some way that choose that life. Uh, but there also are people that I've met that do it because they enjoy it. And again, I'm not endorsing anything. I'm just reporting back to you. Um, I, you know, it's like, okay, I mean, I guess, you know, there's, everybody can have a talent and I guess for some people, that's their talent. And if, again, all of these, all the data we're getting from the internet is is true, okay, we all kind of know that, don't we? On some level. And I guess in recent years with, you know, new platforms that have come up, these people aren't under the thumb of pimps or, you know, abusive boyfriends or what have you, uh, abusive partners and these people are able to sort of do it for themselves. You know, that's, you know, you think back, it's like, man, people used to make adult content for different companies. They didn't own any of it. And then that content can be shared in perpetuity, you know, online. And these people never see a dime. I guess at least it's empowered these performers and gives them, uh, gives them you know, at least, at least they have the power. It's their product. It's their body. So they should be getting 
you know, all of the money for it, all of the, the profit, you know, which is, that, that's the way it should be. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes. Because on the one hand, you have, you know, there's the argument, okay, the rise of OnlyFans, Just for Fans, all of that. That's an indication of cultural decline. And, uh, you know, it shouldn't be happening. You know, you have uh, young women that are putting themselves through school doing that. And again, it's, you know, it, it could just be, you know, uh, pictures of them in bikinis, or it could be, you know, more uh, graphic content. You know, if, if you're, you know, if, if you're able to get where you want to go and you're doing it of your own volition, under your own power, then okay. Again, I don't know that it would necessarily be something I would encourage somebody to do, but if you're a grown adult and you have a beautiful body that people want to look at, you know, I certainly don't have a problem with you wearing a bathing suit and, and or you know, working out or whatever it is and, and people giving you money for that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the more sexual content, again, it's your life. Do what you want, but be safe. I think the key for these people is probably pivoting. And um, the people that I encountered in my car, as uh, at least the people who were doing adult content, uh, some of them they did it just they enjoyed it, and I, that, that was really surprising. Not to say that I didn't think that there weren't people out there that were doing it too, um, because they enjoyed it. But I feel like there's a, there's a really pervasive narrative that I'm sure there's some truth to that if you're doing that, it must be because you're hard up for money, or there's some type of abuse in your background, or drugs, or whatnot. And that does exist. I know for a fact that it does because I again I'm, I've been around. Uh, not to say, and when I when I said that I've been around. Again, I've, taught, I've, sp I've spoken to a lot of people in various walks of life. Uh, I've moved through different social circles in my life and so forth, so I know this stuff exists. But it does seem to be a bit healthier that these folks are able to at least work for themselves. And I've had both men and women in the car that had no qualms whatsoever about telling me that they... Uh, we're adult performers. We're making adult content. They enjoyed it. I, I had people. Um, you know, I'll follow. I'll follow you on social media. Da, 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 and, and you know, you, so you can see what I do. And um, yeah, it, it seemed. I feel like I have a good sense of somebody who's. You know how you meet somebody you're like oh, something's off with this guy or something's off with this this gal. And, uh, okay, yeah, I don't think you're doing this because you like to. I think that there's some unresolved trauma, uh, maybe some self-esteem issues. But there were a fair amount of people that I met, and it's just like, you look at them, it's like, ah, yeah, you, you, you look like an anatomy chart. So maybe it does make sense. You know, you're hyper, hyper fit. You've got a great face. I guess it makes sense that you do this. Uh, but, uh... What also really impressed me about a lot of these people is how a lot of them, like within months of them making, so a gal who was clearing, I think, $10,000 a month. I was shocked that she told me. And just in terms of my own research, seeing people, they're, they're making thousands. Uh, you know, a few fellows that were doing pretty well that within a year, house is paid off. Uh, parents' houses paid off, uh, siblings, college education is paid for, uh, family members who are ill, bills are paid for. I have a hard time supporting criticism of, of what they do when you consider what they're capable of doing in their own lives outside of making that content. You know, they're able to uh, build, you know, a, a comfortable, stable life for themselves as a result of this uh, work that they do. They're able to support their values, be it their families, other business ventures, uh, and so forth. 
I just, I objectively, I don't understand how someone could be upset about that. And again, was just really impressed with how most of them were just like, yep, this is what I'm doing. I'm young, I'm, <clears throat> I'm young, I'm hot, I am healthy. Um, yeah, I'd like to, this one woman, she's like, you know, it's at one point I won't be. At one point, you know, uh, I will be old and decrepit, uh, which, you know, if you know how to biohack, not necessarily the case, but anyways, that wasn't the conversation. And she's like, I'd like to be able to look back and uh, be able to say, yeah, I did that, you know, and I was beautiful and I was powerful and I owned it and I made money off of it and I built a life on it. And I was like, this woman is truly impressive. Um, so again, I don't know if that's, I don't know that that is the degeneracy that maybe more conservative elements would claim that it is. If anything, it's individuals that are free to choose their values, that are able to build a life that they want to live. Again, maybe not the life that you or I would suggest to them, hey, you know what you should do? You should get naked in front of a camera and broadcast it to as many people as possible, charge them for it. But again, I, I personally don't have a problem with that. I maybe would feel differently if it was, you know, one of my nieces or nephews um, you know, it's like, I don't know. It, it's, it's different. I, there are, there are, I think points that more conservative elements can make that, you know, um, you know if you're going to do it, make sure you have an exit plan, make sure you're able to pivot. There's no guarantee that all of these people do make money. I mean, there's some people who make a ton of money and I'm sure that and there's people that, that don't. So, you know, I'm sure there's folks out there that, that roll the dice, put it out there, and maybe don't make any money, but you know, maybe that closes doors for them professionally in other areas. I don't know. From what I've been able to gather from Gen Z, the Gen Z in my family and the Gen Z that I have, you know, collaborated with and, and friends that are Gen Z, they really don't seem to care. It really does seem to be that the people who have the most concern would be, you know, baby boomers, Gen Xers. And in some cases, millennials, I would say the millennials seem to be split. 50% sort of Puritan and 50% laissez-faire. But Gen Z really doesn't care. And in some way, the Gen Z folks around me um, are even more conservative. They, they have a lot less sex and they have, uh, um, you know, just the, the availability of adult content. It's just, it's just always been there. That's, that's the world that they've grown up in. So it, they don't seem to have as big a, a hang-up about it. There might not be racing to do it, you know. Uh, you know they're going to do other things. But if I had a family member who said, you know what, I'm going to do this, um, you know, or if I had a niece or nephew that was like, you know what, I'm young and I'm going to do this, you know, I would, if it were me, I'd be like, okay, are you sure there isn't anything else that you would not want to put your efforts behind? a hobby, uh, an interest, you know, something that you want to either go, maybe you want to learn a trade, maybe you want to go to school, you know, is there anything else? And, you know, I would work, to, you know, have them take that time to do that before they do it. But if they're convinced that that's what's right for them, all I could do is wish them luck. But, you know, there is a roll of the dice in it, uh, like anything else, like, uh, you know, pursuit of, of, of screenwriting or acting, you know, the things that I do. You know, there are no guarantees in life. But I think at the end of the day, does it make you happy? Is it, is, it a, is, is it a high value for you? If it brings you joy, if it feeds your soul, if it, if it allows you to express yourself and who you are, go for it. Yeah, go for it. And, and uh, you know, don't worry about other people because people who truly know you or take the time to get to know you, you know, uh, those are the people that you want around you. But it, it, it really, it is interesting that the, the whole phenomenon now, like I just think back 10 years ago, uh, of people that uh, I had met that did adult content. And this was, you know, again, before these big platforms where people could make money for themselves. You know, you maybe had maybe three or four years of a shelf life. You know, I think it, at least it seemed a lot of these people were more exhibitionist, but it there is a cost and, and I don't think that we should ignore that. 
for as laissez-faire as I am, for as follow your values uh, and do what makes you happy as I am, I, I, you also have to be realistic. And you live in a world where there's going to be people and in industries that just aren't cool with that. And at least back then, maybe as far back as eight years ago, but definitely 10 years ago, uh, I knew some people that did it. And because they did it, they had very limited options coming out of it. You know, a lot of them ended up in the fitness industry. A lot of them, you know, would go into, you know, other things, you know, go into businesses where their body, you know, was just not a factor. You know, they would start wearing glasses or wear contacts or cut their hair a different way or wear their hair a different way. And, you know, they seem to be okay. But, you know, some of them tried to get, you know, more white collar jobs and that wasn't going to happen. The, the amount of people, I would say, of the three people I knew back then that did it, all of them ended up having to kind of go work for themselves. Either become trainers, coaches, uh, realtors, uh, and so forth. But they, they did that and they're all fine. Uh, but there, it, that was just 10 years ago and it seems to have shifted quite a bit. Um, again, I've only been driving or had been driving for about six years. But from when I started in 20. 14, 15, and when I ended in 2020, I could sort of see the shift uh, of, and, and you could definitely, you could, if it came up with different generations, you I, you could definitely tell, you know, uh, when, it, when it was, you know, baby boomers, it's just like, nope, you don't do that. Um, occasionally you get a very, you know, I guess, would you call them liberal or progressive person who was older who, you know, they didn't care. But most of the time, it was like, whew, you know, it's, it, it closes a lot of doors. And for a period of time, it definitely did. And I think it probably still does in, in a way. Uh, but I feel like it might be less of an issue. Again, at least with the younger people in my family, the younger people that I have worked with, I'm collaborating with. It's just kind of like, eh, you know, I wouldn't do it, but, you know, whatever. And they wouldn't necessarily think less of people. So I guess I guess that's a good thing. Because again, going back to the sort of schizophrenia that we have and certainly the hypocrisy we have about you know, you know, if you don't support that type of thing, if if you if you feel that you know sex is best within a monogamous relationship, and that's best because you get to know each other, you get to grow over time, that's a special thing that should be shared with your highest value. I see that. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I believe in that to a large extent. Uh, and I could see why those people would not necessarily support what, what these other folks are doing. But so what? It's like, okay, you live your life the way you want to, and they live their lives the way they want to. This is, again, the biggest problem that I have about our current age of um, incredibly short-sighted, stupid, tribalist, emotional politics and the culture war is it hasn't it doesn't seem to have dawned on people that okay at least we're still free to do what you want you can if you want to be um a more conservative person and you want to live your life by a particular um moral code or religious code because everybody has a moral code it just it's different um you can do that if you are somebody who is more secular and you want to live your life that way, again, so long as none of these people are infringing on each other's rights to pursue their values, their individual rights to, to pursue what they want in life, not violating their person, not violating their property, who cares? Stop shouting at each other. Grow up. Go live your life. And I think that that's kind of the key to this whatever debate, you know, whether it's it's uh, somebody who is uh, a queer person or it's somebody who has decided to be religious. It's your life, but you have no right to enforce your particular values on other people. You can only allow people to be free to pursue their values. Okay? And that's kind of what I've observed, at least with the I guess maybe you could call it evolution of our attitudes towards sex workers and the people that I've encountered in my time uh, driving rideshare. Because I definitely have met more of those people than I did before. Again, I, I knew people 
about 10 or so years ago that had done that, had at least done adult content. Uh, but in terms of sex workers, people who do adult content, uh, met way more of them driving. And again, it was outside of the filter of some commentator or some talking head who needed to score points for his or her side. It was just me, a real human being, talking to another real human being in my back seat, just having a conversation. Uh, you know, I part of me wishes I would have, you know, drawn up NDAs to see if people would be willing to uh, to share these stories. But, it, you know, at the time, it's like I just needed to make money. And it's like, okay, am I really going to stop and slow down my work day to ask every writer, hey, would you be willing to be recorded and sign this NDA so or, or this release? Um, so that we can share our conversation. Yeah, it's just, yeah, at the time, I was like, no, I really need to make money, man. I really, you know, it's LA. You know, I'm a struggling actor uh, and writer. I you know, didn't have time for that. So could have, would have, should have. Hindsight, right? But I've definitely seen the shift. I think it's healthier. Again, I think we could, we could argue as to whether or not people should do that. But there does seem to be this thing that is built into us that you know human beings are sexual beings that it's it's a, it's a part of us it's an important part of us it should not be repressed it should not be oppressed uh, it should be shared in the healthiest way possible whether that be within the confines of a monogamous relationship with someone who is your highest value or with people with whom you have a, an understanding of being safe uh, and being respectful you know, again, I, I again, uh, having those options is a good thing. Um, having the freedom to do those things, I, I think, is important. And I think, you know, I, I would disagree, and I would have huge problem with people who want to curtail anyone's choices in either direction. You have to be free to do those things. And again, every year we get these reports from various. Uh, website outlets that tell us here's what you're watching all that stuff that you say you're not watching you're not interested in well here it is i mean maybe not us individually but i i, I find it fascinating every year when pornhub drops their reports and tells us who's watching what um, yeah it's it's uh it's interesting i read a i'll i'll, I'll close with this I, i'm trying to remember where i read it because again, this is this is sort of a, this this whole interest is something I could I could create an entire podcast about. So I don't know. You tell me if I should or not. But I feel like you know, sex, sexuality, what people are into. It's you know, it's it's you kind of keep it on the DL. I feel we're having more honest conversations because of the internet and because of these things. But I also do kind of feel like we do have a puritanical. We've always had a puritanical right, but now I feel like in some cases we're getting a puritanical left sometimes too. So I don't know. It's it's weird. Gen Z has less sex and is more conservative, but they don't have a problem with this stuff, whereas previous generations do kind of seem to have their hangups. I don't know. Let me leave you with this. And I should have done a better job. I don't remember where I read this, uh, but there was some type of a report that was looking at incidents of um, sexual assaults from just before the uh, the advent of the internet, before people could basically view adult content piped in their house via the internet, and since then. And it was an interesting uh, finding that they discovered that rates of sexual assaults have actually gone down since the advent of internet porn. Uh, which is interesting because we're always told, and I, I remember this, geez, from when I was a kid, that any sort of violent content or sexual content that people consume would somehow make them more sexual and more violent. And according to this report, it seems that with the advent of internet pornography, it seems to have taken, you know, like it's like, uh, you know, a pressure valve, like it's sort of taken that off. And I, I can only see that as a good thing. Um, 
again, we can discuss and talk all day as to whether or not this should be. I mean, it is, you know, what should we do? Is, is it healthy? Is it not? I think there's aspects of it that are definitely healthy and that people should be free to choose their values. And if those values happen to line up with doing this type of thing, again, if they're not hurting anybody or hurting you or taking your property, okay, don't have a problem with it. But uh, there are definite questions about, okay, are people being sexualized at too early an age? Um, how do we protect particularly young people from getting drawn in um, to these things when they maybe shouldn't be? Uh, you know, if you're 18, okay, you know, the law says you can do what you want, but anything below that, I think it's, ooh, we really have to draw the line there. Uh, I don't think that that should be something that, uh, that's, that's something that should be left up to parents to deal with. Uh, just, you know, I, I don't think that we should, uh, again, going back to not letting people impose, you know, their values on you. You have to be free to, to choose them. And, and obviously parents have to be free to parent as they see fit, so long as they're not abusing their kids. So anyways, guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you've uh, hung in uh, this long. I appreciate if you've hung in this long. And yes, I have a light now. <laughs> so I'm a little better lit than the previous episode. So we'll, we'll be continuing to do this. And, uh, yeah, thank you again for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. If there are questions or topics that you have uh, that you'd like me to cover, uh, please let me know. You know, I've, I've got plenty of stories still to tell. But if, there, if you're curious about my, my experience as a rideshare driver, uh, no matter how niche, let me know. I would be happy to answer your questions. So thank you again, and uh, be safe, and let your love lead. Okay, bye.